Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Raymond Yeo. And I'm Joyce Wu. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Chaos erupts in Admiralty as demonstrators opposed to the pro-democracy protests try to remove barricades. Earlier, police surprised protesters in Central and Admiralty by clearing barriers. Ombudsman says residents should be consulted before guest house license is granted. Fights erupted in Admiralty this afternoon when masked men rushed into a pro-democracy protest site and began dismantling barricades. The police struggled to separate the mob from Occupy Central demonstrators in Queensway and arrested three people for assault and possession of weapons. ATV's Winner Wong reports. <laughs> Chaos erupted in Queensway as mass men charged at barricades on day 16 of the mass pro-democracy protest that have paralyzed key areas of Hong Kong. It began at around 1 p.m. when a group of anti-Occupy protesters claiming to be from various organizations showed up on the main thoroughfare in Admiralty. Among them were taxi drivers and workers in the logistics sector who said their businesses have suffered because of the protests and the blockade of major streets. <laughs> Who's going to give me money to feed my family, demanded this man as he tried to rush at the protesters. Many who want the blockades to end brought their vehicles along. Chaos reigned when some masked men similar to the ones who clashed with protesters and police in Mong Kok 10 days ago used knives, scissors and pliers to cut the plastic fasteners holding metal barricades together. Confusion increased as more people arrived to join those opposing the democracy camp. Tensions ran high with flare-ups between all sides. This woman police officer got into a heated argument with Occupy protesters. A war of words erupted between the rival protesters. Police formed a human chain to keep the two groups apart. There were times when emotional protesters from both sides tried to rush at each other. Officers had to raise banners, warning people not to push. After about two hours, police escorted the anti-Occupy crowd to Cotton Tree Drive to prevent clashes. As they were led away, Occupy protesters sang the happy birthday song to drown out the chants from their opponents. Calm returned, but the confrontation frightened some protesters. Others began re-erecting their metal barriers. Um, we're making the barricades more inconvenient to take down. <laughs> Because um, we're here to uh, talk about, like, to tell, make a message about what we believe in. And we don't think it's right that people should be attacking us because we're expressing our right to protest. The police sent a warning to both camps. We want to point out that reinforcing the existing obstacles or setting up new obstacles to announce the occupied areas and to block the roads is illegal and extremely irresponsible. Police will collect evidence for investigation on any breach of the law. Officers today arrested three men aged between 18 and 47 for assault and possessing weapons. Winawang, ATV News. Earlier today, scores of police officers showed up in Central and Admiralty to remove barricades. The officers insisted they were not trying to clear out pro-democracy protesters, but Chief Executive Leung Chen-ying warns the blockades cannot last forever. The police put on a show of force as they marched towards the junction of Queensway and Queensville Central at 7 a.m. Despite repeated warnings of imminent action to break up street blockades, Pro-democracy protesters were taken by surprise and put up no resistance. Officers wasted no time cutting plastic cords binding the barricades. Trains then removed the metal fences. The clearance enabled commuters traveling from the mid-levels to reach Central via Garden Road ahead of the morning rush hour.
The police formed a human chain outside the Bank of China Tower to stop anyone from charging towards the clearance zone. But as news of the operation spread, scores of demonstrators arrived to defend another set of barricades about 100 meters away. Many brought goggles and even gas masks in case officers used pepper spray or tear gas. Protesters near Wan Chai also reinforced barriers close to Harcourt Road. There was a tense standoff between police and the group, but no altercation took place. Protesters accused the force of resorting to psychological warfare to get them off the streets. This demonstrator said the police disrespected them by sneaking to the site while they were asleep and urged the government to talk to student leaders. Over in Mong Kok, protesters arrived with a cartload of wooden planks near Langham Place at around midnight. Their attempt to fortify the barricades between Portland and Argyle streets was interrupted by officers. An argument ensued. The police retreated after five minutes and the group began strengthening the roadblock with bamboo scaffolding and metal bars as officers looked on. Campers on Nathan Road enjoyed a largely peaceful night, apart from hecklers, who in turn were treated to a round of happy birthdays sung by protesters. Happy birthday, no, no. Early this morning, the police got their way using cranes to remove planks stacked on the pavement. The move allowed northbound traffic from Portland Street to pass through, easing the gridlock in the area. The police insisted the operations were not aimed at clearing out protesters, but to relieve traffic congestion. The chief executive was less forthcoming when asked if this was the start of a full-fledged clearance. Speaking after attending a regional forum in Guangzhou, Leung Chenying said the government has been exercising maximum tolerance, but warned that the protests cannot carry on forever. He said the force will continue removing obstacles in areas where few people gather and restore order without engaging in confrontations. The catering industry says business has plunged by 40 percent since the pro-democracy protests began. And demonstrators have tried to stop trucks delivering copies of the Apple Daily, saying that the popular newspaper is biased towards the pro-democracy camp. ATV's Elson Chan reports. Dozens of anti-occupy protesters staged a sit-in early this morning outside the headquarters of Next Media in Cheng Kuan O. The company is owned by tycoon Jimmy Lai, a staunch democracy supporter. The demonstrators accused the company, which also publishes the popular Apple Daily, of being biased. They camped outside to stop copies of the newspaper from leaving the building. But Next Media used cranes to lift stacks of newspapers over the wall. Other protesters sat in the middle of the road trying to block delivery vehicles, but they were persuaded by the police to leave. There was another setback for the media group today when Apple Daily's website was attacked by hackers. As the protests continued, the catering industry said it's feeling the pinch. Restaurants in Central, Causeway Bay and Mong Kok have seen business slump by 40 percent in the past two weeks. To offset losses, several eateries have reduced their operating hours or cut the working hours of staff. Representatives of the sector have urged the government and student leaders to hold talks as soon as possible to minimize losses to businesses. For one student leader, today is a special day. Joshua Wong, convener of the activist group Scholarism, turned 18, giving him the right to vote in local elections. He marked the occasion by making three wishes that the protests will remain peaceful, demonstrators will continue the struggle for democracy, and Beijing will allow genuine universal suffrage in Hong Kong. Alison Chan, ATV News. The government has defended its decision not to open up a public square outside its headquarters in exchange for a stretch of occupied road in Admiralty. This came as Electrical President Zhang Yuxing announced extra security measures for two key meetings this, this week. Just after the government rejected calls by protesters to open Civic Square outside its headquarters in exchange for ending their blockade of Queensway, 
This is what happened. Hundreds of Occupy Central opponents stormed the area, clashing with the police and pro-democracy demonstrators. But administration director Kitty Choi strongly rebutted claims that the government is putting its interests ahead of public safety. One has to acknowledge that the central government offices has to consider the overall security risks by allowing the protesters to occupy full court as such. After all, after all, we have got 3,000 people working in the government building, the East Wing Four Court. It is part of the central government offices. Uh, it is part of our facility. It is mainly used for vehicular circulation area and served as a drop off and also pick up point. It has got its functions and it is not a public open space as we have stressed many times. She also expressed regret that the siege of Long Wall Road and Timwa Avenue has led to the cancellation or relocation of more than 40 functions and conferences. Meanwhile, LegCo President Zhang yuk Singh announced extra security measures ahead of the council meeting on Wednesday. The first session after the legislature's summer recess was called off last week over security concerns. Lawmakers wishing to bring in guests must now submit applications one day in advance to allow security personnel make arrangements. Zhang also expects Chief Executive Lian Chenying to attend the question and answer session on Thursday and did not rule out extra security by inviting the police to Lechko. Now for the rest of the day's news. The Ombudsman's office says residents of a building should be consulted before granting a guest house license. The watchdog also says there have been few prosecutions against unlicensed hostels, despite a sharp rise in the number of complaints. ATV's Arthur Akula reports. The monitoring of guest houses was stepped up after a fire at Continental Mansion in North Point in December injured 25 people, many of them budget travelers. Licensed hostels were operating on several floors, even though the building's deed indicated they were only allowed on the ground, first and second floors. The administration is considering stricter penalties for unlicensed guest houses and easier arrangements for inspections. But following an investigation into the rising number of guest houses in the city, the Ombudsman accused the Home Affairs Department of neglecting the views of residents when guest house licenses are granted. I, I think with the blooming number of um, this uh, guest house in place, we do think that, uh, we, we also think that uh, the life uh, and also uh, the residents there are greatly affected. So we think it would be fair for them to, uh, yeah, uh, to give out their, to, to have their views heard by the uh, uh, by the department when they are considering issuing the thing. Lau pointed out residents had to deal with conflicts over the use of lifts, security concerns because of the large numbers of strangers, and more rubbish which adds to the cleaning bill. The number of prosecutions for unauthorized guest houses has been rising, but is still too low according to the government watchdog. Last year there were 1,225 complaints about unlicensed guest houses, but there were only 171 prosecutions, with 10 escaping conviction. Lau also criticized arrangements for allocating columbarium niches for people to store the ashes of their loved ones. She cited a complaint from a man who had applied two years ago for a niche in a newly completed columbarium in Wohop Shack. He was unsuccessful in the ballot for the first two phases and was left to try his luck in the final one. Lau accused the administration of ignoring the public's anxiety and failing to increase the number of niches to meet demand. She called for assistance to allocate niches on a first-come, first-served basis. For the new niches, we do hope that they would uh, have a full examination and review of what they are doing now and to have, a, uh, an, uh, to, to have some um, uh, consideration and review on what they should do in future to ensure that the allocation is done in a speedy and also orderly manner. Lao said should the ballot system be kept, then priority should be given to unsuccessful applicants in the earlier phases. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. Dozens of health workers in the U.S. are under observation after a colleague who helped to look after a man who died from Ebola became the first person to contract the virus in America. Fears of a deadly disease spreading surged as healthcare staff in Liberia planned to go on strike.
protect. Liberia has pleaded with medical workers not to go on strike in support of demands to raise the pay of those involved in the fight against the Ebola virus. Members of a health workers union are also pressing for protective equipment and insurance after the disease killed about a hundred people in the medical sector. Liberia is one of the countries worst affected by the Ebola epidemic, which has claimed more than 4,000 lives, mainly in West Africa. In the U.S., President Barack Obama called for tighter safety procedures after a health worker became the first to be infected in America. The unidentified victim took care of a man who tested positive for Ebola after arriving in the U.S. from Liberia. He died last week. The health worker who had close contact with the patient during his stay in hospital became infected despite wearing full protective gear. While her home in Dallas was disinfected, health officials are monitoring dozens of other health care workers. Unfortunately, it is possible in the coming days that we will see additional cases of Ebola. This is because the health care workers who cared for this individual may have had a breach of the same nature of the individual who appears now to have a preliminary positive test. That risk is in the 48 people who are being monitored, all of whom have been tested daily. In Oakland, California, health workers protested against what they described as a lack of proper training for those treating possible Ebola patients. In other world news, Blade Runner Oscar Pistorius is in court again today for the start of a sentencing hearing that could last most of the week. And Typhoon Fong Fong continues to batter Japan. ATV of Banarok reports. Typhoon Fong Fong hit Japan's southern island of Kyushu earlier this morning on its way to Honshu, the main island. Hundreds of flights were cancelled as a result. It's the strongest storm to lash Japan this year and forced the evacuation of about 450,000 people on Kyushu and Shikoku, as well as the far southern island of Okinawa, which was battered yesterday. Dozens of people were injured over the weekend as Wong Fong whipped the country with heavy rain and winds of up to 234 kilometers per hour. For the first time ever, a Nippon professional baseball game has been cancelled due to a typhoon. Dozens of countries meeting in Cairo have pledged 5.4 billion U.S. dollars to rebuild the Gaza Strip following the 50-day onslaught by Israel early this year. The bombardment killed more than 2,100 Palestinians, most of them civilians. 73 Israelis, mostly soldiers, were also killed. U.S. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon will visit Gaza tomorrow to view the devastation. 18,000 homes as well as schools, mosques and utility stations were destroyed. As a part of this effort to look ahead and build a better future, I believe it is important to be on the ground. Washington has pledged 212 million US dollars. Gong Xiaosheng, China's special envoy to the Middle East, said Beijing will strengthen cooperation with UN groups so its aid will be used more effectively. Disgraced South African track star Oscar Pistorius is in court again today to find out whether he'll spend time behind bars for killing his model girlfriend Reva Steenkamp or be freed. A murder conviction would have almost certainly carried a jail sentence, but the Paralympic sprinter was found guilty of culpable homicide, South Africa's equivalent of manslaughter. The sentence for which can be as light as community service. After a six-month trial that gripped South Africa, as well as millions more around the world, opinions are mixed on the outcome. Many South Africans believe he will avoid the maximum punishment of 15 years in prison and some even say he'll get off scot-free because he's got money. Pistorius claims the shooting was a tragic mistake, but prosecutors pointed out that using lethal force against an intruder is only allowed if there is a direct threat to a person's life, a law gun owners must acknowledge when they're applying for a license. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. China's exports surged last month to record its biggest increase in 19 months. Policymakers in Beijing expect the momentum to continue into the fourth quarter, reducing the need to cut interest rates. ATV's An Chang reports. Trade growth in the world's second biggest economy last month surpassed expectations, boosting market confidence in the country's economic strength. 
Exports in September grew the fastest in 19 months, surging 15.3 percent from a year ago to 213.7 billion U.S. dollars. The figure released by the General Administration of Customs today was well above market expectations of a 12 percent rise and almost double the 9.4 percent increase in August. Imports rose by 7 percent to $182.7 billion, reversing a 2.4 percent fall in August and surpassing expectations of a 2 percent decline. The trade surplus for September was $31 billion, down from almost $50 billion in August. Experts say that better-than-expected figures suggest external demand is strong while domestic consumption is picking up. Customs spokesman Zheng Yuesheng said China's trade has shown gradual improvement and the trend is expected to continue into the fourth quarter. The encouraging trade figures have helped offset a property slump and will allow the central bank to keep interest rates unchanged as the country tries to meet economic growth of 7.5 percent this year. The World Bank recently trimmed its forecast for the mainland's growth this year from 7.6 percent to 7.4 percent. But Premier Li Keqiang predicted that China will avoid a hard landing and express 